and each of us, our main purpose is to forgive. It's our only purpose. It's found on that word, because I think there's a whole lot more to that word than forgive. Well, forgiveness, when I've been asked about the question, when you first, a lot of times when you first work with the Course, you'll notice in the workbook he has like um, lessons where he'll say, um, picture someone you have a grievance against or something, you know, and he'll say, you probably have thought of him now, and then, you know, surround your friend in light, and then transfer the light to one you, whom, whom you call a friend. So, he's actually got like guided visualization exercises right in the Course that are helpful. I would call those more introductory. I mean, I think that if you really get into the Course and you really start to say, what is forgiveness really, you know, that you start to see other things. Um, for instance, he'll say, you forgive your brother for what he has not done to you, not for what he has. That's not the way the ego sees it. The ego says, I've got it right here, black and white. It's factual. He, he <laughs> frowned at me first, he screamed at me, he called me names, and he walked out. You know, there's the memory, there's the visual memory. That's a sin, you know. Now, and it's true, the ego says, face it, it's true, he did it. He did it, there's no denying it, you saw it with your own two eyes. Now, basically, the ego's forgiveness is to forgive what's true. So, here's this perception, you know, of what somebody did to us and everything, and basically the ego kind of says, dresses it up, because I'm a good course student, you know, because I'm, I'm elevated in, in spirituality, out of the kindness of my heart, <laughs> even though you don't deserve it, I have, I'm able to forgive you. And Jesus, Jesus kind of says, get off it. You know, kind of like, that's not forgiveness at all. That's the ego's version of forgiveness. Forgive your brother for what he has not done. Now that takes, you know, you really got to get into the metaphysics of the Course. That's where this whole thing being in a projection and it being illusion is really important. Because what I can't stand to look in my own mind and see I project out in the form of a behavior. In other words, these attack thoughts that we're holding in our minds, we project out and we call forth witnesses to bring to us exactly what we think. So if we are thinking guilty thoughts, and we're thinking these attack thoughts, we'll call forth witnesses that will see proof. <laughs> you know? So you can see where forgiveness in the end comes down to letting go of the attack thoughts. That's lesson number 23. I can escape from the world I see by giving up attack thoughts. I mean, that's as clear as you can. After he sets the groundwork in the first 22, he really comes through with that one. Another thing is, forgiveness is described, we've already talked about how there's, I call them forward thoughts or real thoughts in our mind, which is the Holy Spirit's thoughts. Your mind is very powerful, the Holy Spirit says. You're very powerful and your mind is causative. And the backward thoughts are, I'm a little victim in this big world, and I'm teeny, and you know, I'm, I'm a hopeless victim, helpless. And those are backward thoughts. So the more we get real clear, what forgiveness really is, is just turning cause and effect around in our mind. So we let go of all the backward thoughts, and all we retain are the thoughts of the Holy Spirit, you know, and that's then we're at peace. So, you know, the other thing too about it is it seems to be a process, and I would say that as you work with the Course, it seems to be one of the deeply, most deeply rooted beliefs is the belief in linear time. So as long as that belief's way down there, we'll say that's on the first floor of the World Trade Center. <laughs> you know, as long as that one's kind of anchored down there, it's going to seem like it's going to take time to do this. Now, the whole the basis of the Course is to start to see that all, the Master Switch shows that all of the branches of the tree, or all the floors in the World Trade Center are identical. You know, they're just different fragments of the same ego belief. As long as we believe that they're different, and that some concepts and beliefs, or like we were saying earlier, are more valuable than others, are important, or, you know, then it's like I'm going to hold, I'll hold a few back from the Holy Spirit, and it seems like I'll go through the tree and say, I'll give you this one, give you this one, this one, this one, ah, ah, this one, this one, ah. yeah. As long as we retain some beliefs, it's kind of like saying that we want to hold on to some illusions. And the truth can't be reconciled with illusions at all. The whole, you know, Jesus at one point in the Course, pretty late, says you will have learn this Course entirely or not at all. It makes sense, you know, why he's so non-compromising. He doesn't, he knows that if, if there's not, if there's a hundred branches on the tree and we give up 99, we're still not going to be at peace. Because we'll still have one twig dangling down there, you know, he's saying, 
It just takes one complete instant. So that's really what the Course in Miracles is, is, is it seems like a process, but the more, the deeper you get into it, the more you see that you can recognize these backwards and forward thoughts. And you say, all the backward thoughts, I don't want any of them. You know? I don't want one of them. And then that's where the release takes place. So that's kind of a deeper way of looking at, at forgiveness than just kind of like, well, I'll say I'm sorry, or I'll make amends, or, you know, something at a, at a form level. Uh, what does David Hoffmeister's mind do all day? <laughs> I watch. <laughs> I mean, I mean what, how do you perceive the world? What do you think about? Well, there's a quote. I, I was going through the course today, and there was a, a quote that I found on Teachers of God, and this was, this was one that really resonated with me, because this is kind of how it feels for me a lot. But it says, um, Awareness of dreaming is the real function of God's teachers. They watch the dream figures come and go, shift and change, suffer and die. Yet they are not deceived by what they see. They recognize that to behold a dream figure as sick and separate is no more real than to regard it as healthy and beautiful. Unity alone is not a thing of dreams, and it is this God's teachers acknowledge as behind the dream, beyond all seeming, and yet surely theirs. That's really kind of what it comes down to more. It becomes like a natural detachment. That they talk about, you know, the Zen, the Buddhist, and the and the yogis and everything, and talk about a state of detachment. But the only thing about a lot of the paths of the world is they've talked about, you know, you got to do this, these rituals, meditate, you know, 14 hours a day, and sit this way, and hold your hand this way, and this and that. And the Course is basically saying, all you have to do is hold on to your purpose of forgiveness, and let go of these false beliefs, and you will become detached. You don't have to, it's not like you uh, detached from the forms per se, but you detach from your desire to judge the forms. Because as soon as I judge some things good and some things bad, then I make the world real. It can't be an equally illusory world if part of it's good and part of it's bad. You see how that kind of denies that the world is, is an illusion if, if I do that. And so, it can seem at times, too, like people can say, well, what, about your, what about things like likes and dislikes and opinions? Well, pretty soon you cease to have an opinion. You cease to take sides on issues because you can see the, the foolishness of, of opinions and judgments and taking sides. People will say, um, well, what about things like preferences? <laughs> like, how do you live in this world without preferences? But it's like, it's like they start to fade. You know, it's not like that they're yanked away. That was my old way of, of approaching things. It was kind of like if you had, you know, desires and, and it seemed to be so powerful and so strong, instead of wrestling with them, the more you stay focused on your purpose, it's like they start to dry up, you know, and then you can like flick them off like some dandruff instead of, you know, <laughs> wrestling and battling with them, which is the way it seems for a lot of us that when anybody who's been in addictions, in any way, shape, or form, you know, that, that that's really what it comes down to. Is judgment is our only addiction. And, and really all we have to do is give up judgment and then everything else will take care of itself. That's good news. So do you just clear your mind and just be or just watch things as they go by and don't get involved in them or what? It's not so much passive in the sense that, um, you know, the Holy Spirit can work through us. And a lot of times, I think with a lot of the Eastern approach, people think of detachment and, and watching your mind as just sitting there and not doing anything. And in the, in the very, very, very ultimate sense, if you read the section in the Course called, I Need Do Nothing, I mean, that's literally what it comes down to. In the end, when you've given up your judgments and there's nothing else to pursue, and you can sink down into the light, go down in the basement, that you literally need do nothing. I mean, that's, that's the happy realization at the end. But for the mind that's not trained and is too afraid to go down to the basement there, then what happens is, it's like you, you get onto this purpose and then the thing that you would most want to do, you know, that comes to your mind from a place of non-investment, then you do. It just comes down to, to mind watching and there are times in, in the Course where he even says, search your mind. There are other times where he says, don't search, just let the thoughts bubble up, you know. And when, when they do, and if I start to feel a little out of peace or whatever, you know, I, I do, what's your name? 
relationship. Tim, I do what Tim talked about was I bring it back to my identity attachment. In other words, I try to trace the, the string or the cord back into my mind. And what happens is when I really do that, it, whenever I'm feeling a little out of sorts, it's because it has something to do with this personhood identity. Not with my abstract mind, but with my identification with this person. So that's helpful too, because I can, as soon as I can see it, I can say, oh boy, whoops. <laughs> and once you've whoops it, then it's out of there. Do you, so do you analyze what it is, or you just notice that it's there, and then you just give it up for a while? I don't think analyzing is, uh, oh, yeah. I think at the beginning I, I used to do that, but what, what happens with analyzing is analyzing is kind of a breaking apart. And what happens is the more I get in the course, the more it's like, is it backwards or forward? If it's backwards, whoops. You see, that, that takes the analysis out of it. If I'm, if I'm starting to try to find, oh, compare this branch to this branch, you, know, you can see how you can get it. It can be amusing to the ego you know, to, to start doing that. So it's more of just like backwards and forwards. Covered a lot of ground. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit in relation to health, because that's always a big thing for everybody, I think. And sometimes it's, you know, it is for me to try to work my way through my feelings about it. You know, that uh, fears as you get older of being sick or terminally ill, or being, and, and I know, you know, again, I, I know the theory as far as the body and all that, you know, but. There just seems to be sometimes a space between theory and application that, you know, I'm, I'm and I believe that, that um, you know, there is a point at which I probably wouldn't have any questions, you know, but sometimes you're still back in that area where you have questions. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it may be someone, it may be someone else that's very ill or, or who has died, and I try to, I try to, figure this out, you know, in, in my thinking that, you know, in the coursework and everything, uh, it seems to me there shouldn't be illness because that's of the mind again, you know, and there shouldn't be that. And then when you see it and you see someone die, then it's very hard to reconcile that, you know, and you know that they were seemingly in the world's view at least a very right thinking person, you know, and uh, doesn't it appear to you they could have brought illness upon themselves. This is from the teacher's manual on how, how are healing and atonement related. <clears throat> basically, it's the one, like third paragraph, where it basically says, the idea that a body can be sick is a central concept in the ego's thought system. So, the idea that a body can be sick is a central concept in the ego's thought system. And it seems that way in this world. I mean, it's a, it's a common accepted thing that symptoms are seen and that, that a body's sick. But he's just saying, once again, it's an idea. This thought gives the body autonomy, separates it from the mind, and keeps the idea of attack inviolate. If the body could be sick, atonement would be impossible. A body that can order a mind to do as it sees fit could merely take the place of God and prove salvation is impossible. So, it gets back to our initial discussion about the levels and believing that there's something causative down here at the world of form. Because, I mean, that's literally the way that the deceived mind sees things. I mean, just we'll take something simple like germs. You know, we've grown up, we've learned that there's certain things that carry germs. You know, roaches carry germs, and if you leave food out, and you know, it, in the bathroom if you don't wash your hands and so so on and so forth, you know. The basic view of course is that that's how one gets the flu or, or cold is through germs. You know? They even study it through sneezes in the air and everything. But you see how the whole that whole thing is basically saying that there's something that's happening on the screen that these germs are coming and somehow getting into this body and that's giving the body the flu or whatever. You can see how it still doesn't jive with what the course is saying. The Course is saying that only the mind can be sick, and that when the mind is sick, it thinks that it's made up of self-concept that's different than spirit. It thinks that it's this teeny little self, and not only that, it wants to be right about this little self. You know, I'm unique, I'm special, 
I'm important and I'm